my name is Beatrix Ruf. I'm the director of the Hartwig Art Foundation, and together with Emily Pesic, the director of the Reichs Academy for the Bill and the Künste, and Leonardo de la Noche from Memory James, uh, Memory James Games. Memory James. Uh, we're doing this <laughs> tonight. <laughs> Uh, this project actually started at the beginning of 2020 already, and the Reichs Academy and the Hartwig Art Foundation decided to start a research project together, um, initiated really by our mutual curiosity about how artists are working at a time of rapid technological change, and to explore future possibilities and the impact of existing and upcoming technologies on our work, and also on the future of our institutions. With Leonardo, as mentioned before, and Arthur Steiner, who is also here in the audience, uh, and Memory Gems, we found great partners to conduct this project um, and its research, uh, which we at least imagined to span until 2024. This conference now is the first public program of our project, and we are very thankful to De Bali to collaborate with us on this. Uh, Yuri, Yuri Albrecht just left for the very important Buchenball, which is the most important uh, event in Amsterdam, as we know. Uh, but will come, will join us tomorrow. And we thank him very much for, again, for a very, very uh, nice collaboration. And of course, we want to thank his great team for doing this with us. Leonardo will speak a bit later about the conference in general. Uh, and I wanted to tell you a bit about what the Hartwig Art Foundation actually is doing. I'm not sure if everyone knows already. Uh, we are working on a new museum actually in Amsterdam just now, uh, which will be the home to a collage of many functions in one building and also a collage of many activities in one building. We will have spaces for communities to use, spaces to show art, very traditional, and its widest appearances, from time-based to physical to virtual, spaces for interdisciplinary and hybrid forms of working and experiences, experiencing together, and spaces for living and working literally inside the museum. Our questions are, of course, what would, we, what, would a space for physical and virtual uh, art be in the future? And what the making for art would look like this? How can we support also new generations of artists whose needs and work methods are not accounted for by current art world models as they exist? How do continuous changes in the technologies we use influence the way that we think and the ways of the thinking of artists too? Uh, how do they change communities, audiences, and art organizations beyond the field of art regarding authorship, regarding privacy, democracy, and decision making, uh, accessibility, sustainability, and economics in general? For Hartwig Art Foundation, this project is a way to learn and to explore, to question how institutions in service of artists' production could look at changing tools and continued flexibilities of spaces for production, but also the product productivity of spaces, providing a relevant function in the contemporary and continuously evolving conditions of our reality. We hope we can possibly prototype workshops and networks for cultural tenants in our future museum here in Amsterdam, but we want to continuously host new ideas, technologies and knowledge production in spaces, workshops and programs as an offer to the artists and to cultural producers working with us in the institution, but also in the city and beyond. Looking at the list of all the speakers and participants who join us this weekend, I'm sure we will be inspired and come out of this conference with many constructive questions, ideas, and also many relationships. Thank you again to De Bali, Juri Albrecht, Jante Mosselmann, who was very uh, crucial to organizing uh, the event here at the De Bali. A big thank to Leonardo and Arthur. A big thank to Emily and the Reichs Academy. There were great workshops already happening today. Emily, I'm sure we'll be talking about. And I want to personally really thank the artists, uh, at the artists, 
the team of the Hartwig Art Foundation, Astrid Schumacher and Henry Sandro. A very special <laughs> shout out for you, Henry. <laughs> There's a word in German which is called Tausend Sasa. <laughs> That's what you are. Uh, I found a, re a translation into English which is check off the trade, but I'm sure that's a very old-fashioned style to say it. But uh, you're not only handling our communication and our relationship in our aspect. But um, this was a great, great job you did. Uh, we also want to thank Laura Urbo, Navi Ciute, I hope I pronounced that right, for introducing us to new tools in communication and taking care of our Discord community. Passing on to Emily to continue yes. our talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Beatrix. It's really wonderful to see everyone here. Gosh, the light's bright. Um, I'm going to continue with thanks, actually, while Beatrix started them. And I, first of all, want to thank, well, the Hartwig Art Foundation for the collaboration. Um, we embarked on a journey out of mutual curiosity. Uh, and it's been, well, an exciting one so far. And I think this uh, couple, of the, tonight and tomorrow will intensify that and uh, very curious and excited about where that's going to take us. Um, I do also want to thank Henry <coughs> for all the incredible work. <laughs> um, I'd also like to thank the Rikes Academy team, some of whom are here. Um, uh, Jose, who's uh, uh, one of our specialists in the media lab. Um, Jim Van Gael from our public program, and Martijnsche Halman, who sadly couldn't be with us this evening. Uh, the character for the um, uh, conference has been uh, created by Kevin Bray, who's an alumnus of ours, and I wanted to say thank you to him and also to Clara Lesia uh, for the graphic design work. Uh, we had some really great workshops at the Rikes Academy today, um, so I want to thank all of those uh, who led those. Um, Black Swan, uh, Ying Cheng's studio, and the HM. Um, I have to say it was really exciting to briefly step into all of your worlds, um, and it made, uh, yeah, uh, uh, for me to, to start entering into this sphere that we're exploring over these uh, couple of days was really inspiring. So. Thank you for your generosity in sharing uh, what you do. Um, before I hand over to uh, Leonardo, I'd like to say a few words about the Rikes Academy and how we come into this, uh, this world. Um, we're an artist res in residence program. We have up to 50 artists working in our building at one time, and artists coming from all over the world with a really wide range of practices and ideas that they're working on. Um, we work in a monumental building. We have a 150-year history, and we have a lot of workshops that are ranging from analog to digital. So for us, um, it's really an, an environment for experimentation for the artists who are working in our building all year round. And one of the exciting things is to see how those experiments play out when artists are working in, in, our, in our workshops and spaces. And quite often that is moving between analog and digital. And um, Jose, for example, was telling me about artists and artists that's working in ceramics and VR, crossing between different, two different workshops. We've seen artists coming in as painters and going out as, you know, working in more digital technologies. Um, today there was one of our paint, painter alumni and a, a sculptor performer alumnus creating avatars. So it's a really exploratory and cross-disciplinary environment. Um, and as an organization, we're very much fueled by practice and by following artistic practice and also trying to anticipate where the future of practice will go. And so um, often it's a kind of, yeah, chicken and egg scenario of trying to like uh, listen and uh, witness a lot of different experimentations, but also trying to see what do we need to do as our next steps. And so that's one of the th reasons why we wanted to start to research this terrain. And so we, with the Hartwig Art Foundation, found a common interest and curiosity and invited uh, Leonardo and Arta to, 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 to work with us on this uh, in collaboration with our team and the Hartwig team. Uh, yeah, so we're very curious about yeah, where this will, will lead us. And this event uh, for us is about opening this research up and learning, listening, um, hearing about what's happening in the field in the widest sense, 
um, and also to listen to the criti critical debates that are playing out in this field, to also understand where do we locate ourselves, um, and yeah, as well to understand more broadly the world that we live and work in, the context that we're working in, um, and where the kind of urgencies are in that. What are the needs for artists, but also more broadly than that, uh, for a whole range of cultural practitioners, and how can we widen out our, the territories that we work in and create uh, cross-pollination? So, yeah, we're also wondering what, what kind of role can we play in this field and how can we position ourselves? So having dropped into the workshops today, it was already, I have to say, very um, compelling to see what types of worlds are being created and what discussions are playing out within them. So looking forward to hearing more over the next, uh, this evening and over the coming days. And I'm going to pass over to uh, Leonardo to tell you a bit more about where we're going. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be super brief and straightforward. So first of all, let's continue to thank you to Beatrix and Emily for the introduction, but also yeah, for the unwavering support and the initiation of this project, um, the conference. So the, our goal with the conference is really to critically engage with the metaverse in two ways, both as a social cultural context in the making, as well as a moment of convergence of different technologies and you know what the implications simply are for artists and the art field in general. To reach this goal, we essentially organized the conference to be um, an anthology of approaches, if you want, by great international artists, technologists, and researchers. On the one hand, these approaches really remind us that the metaverse doesn't exist in a vacuum. It is true that you know, as soon as I say metaverse, you're thinking virtual worlds, you're thinking gaming worlds, you're thinking Mark Zuckerberg, most likely. Uh, but thinking of it as purely a virtual context um, misses really the big picture, which is that the metaverse, however we want to define it, and I'm sure tomorrow we're going to spend time on that, it's really across the um, physical and virtual. And so much of the physical world influences it. You can think of you know, laws and, and regulations, for instance, or hardware distribution that decides who can access these or not. The infrastructure to sustain it, uh, the cost of the infrastructure. On the other hand, it's also a moment in time. And it's a moment where you know, decades in the making technologies are coming to fruition for mainstream application all at the same time. I don't need to mention ChatGPT. I'm sure everyone is aware of it here, and, and DALI, but you know, blockchain is already more than 10 years old and being applied you know, to many different fields. Game engines used to be uh, you know, the keystone only of the gaming industry, but now they're essentially the backbone of the entertainment industry as a whole, and there are countless examples of this. So indeed, what we're interested in is the overlap of these technologies, because this overlap creates frictions. Uh, they create opportunities, and especially how artists engage with this technology, both pushing them forward, but also pushing against them. Generally, we just want you know, this conference to be a welcoming setting to discuss all these critical topics. I'm sure there are many opinions, also many feelings attached to it, but we're just, you know, just going to learn from each other. So without further ado, I think I'm going to ask, ask you to, to see it. Thanks a lot. <laughs> So I'm sure everyone is itching to, to see the movie, of course, of Ian, and then hear from him. Uh, just a few words, uh, if you don't know, the work already, we're not going to watch it, it's about an hour long. Life After Bob is an episodic anime series built in the Unity game engine and presented uh, live in real time. Tonight we see an episode in a cinematic format, not in the interactive one. And Life After Bob imagines a future in which the internet extends into our nervous system. Psychotropic foods unify physical and psychic realities into a fluid experience stream. AI entities are permitted to co-inhabit human minds and anomi, or the breakdown of ethical standards and values, reigns. So please enjoy the movie. Hi, everyone. Um, let me welcome Yan Cheng to the stage and you to the seats. <laughs> come in, come in.
I trust most of you know Ian's work, but let, let's do the bio in the institutional way. Ian Schenk is an, an artist living and working in New York. His work has been widely exhibited, including part of solo presentation at MoMA, MoMA PS1 in New York, separate in Galleries London, in Seoul, The Shed New York. There is a very long list of countries where you showed your work. So let's say all over. <laughs> And since 2012, Chang has produced a series of simulations exploring an agent's capacity to deal with an ever-changing environment. So, thanks a lot for the work, Ian. It's fantastic, first of all. Oh, uh, thank you for your attention. I know it's a long thing to sit through and uh, it's getting late, but I really appreciate your attention for this. So there is so much in, the, in this movie that it's kind of hard. <laughs> I mean, where to start from? Uh, we're going to start with a couple of, of questions and then you know, just include the audience. I'm, I'm sure there's several questions. But my first one is about what we didn't see, because of course we saw the cinematic version of the work, but there is um, an interactive simulation right, part that is actually how this is shot. So my first question, um, is about simulation itself, right? Like, so the entire world of Life After Bob, it's a simulation in Unity, but simulation is a big theme as well in the, in the movie. You know, there is a thousand lives experiences that is, we can call it a self-exploration simulation. Then you have the Destiny Bob, which is a self-optimization simulation. So why is simulation such a central, uh, has such a central role in uh, your work? Um, yeah, well, uh, well, growing up, I, one of my favorite video games was this game called Sim City by Will Wright. And for me, it was uh, the first video game where you played a, kind of like an abstract mayor dealing with city planning, which sounds so boring. You're dealing with really bor seemingly boring systems from the point of view of a child. But somehow Will Wright, the magic trick that he pulled off in the game was to make you fall in love with all those systems, like how to put plumbing and electricity through a city, how to zone commercial and real estate and industrial like areas, and how to make that work for a city, and then to destroy it with a disaster. And if you've ever played SimCity, you know the pleasures of building up a city in this kind of systemic way and falling in love with the city you build and then destroying it and then rebuilding again. And prior to that, all the games I ever played, you played as an avatar, you were shooting something. It was much more like embodied. And so I became obsessed with this idea that you could a game could be more than just a game with a goal, but rather almost like a super hyper toy that you could prod and it would give you a complex result. And you could prod in a different way. You could see the butterfly effects or you could uh, try to engineer something really complicated and you realize it has zero effect on the total system. And so I fell in love with systems through SimCity and I've been, I think I've been chasing that ever since. This makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, I'm a gamer as well. Less on the simulation, more like linear storytelling, but you know, this is not your cup of tea. <laughs> You're more into the entire wor encompassing world. Um, you know, Left After Bob, it's sci-fi, right? It's, it's an anime series actually, and you're making more episodes, right? I would love to. Yeah, like you, you mentioned seven as the magic number, potentially seven more. Um, so I have a question uh, around this because, you know, like uh, sci-fi, wh whether that's, you know, as a genre, whether that's, you know, movies, novels, video games, it's always about, they're essentially thought experiments, right? You, you take these and this condition, you either drive them to the extreme or you fast forward and you get such future or such a world. And then in yours, you, you know, your departure point is there is an anomic crisis, which anomi if, some of you don't know, I had to Google it personally. It's a term from sociology, right? That means like a crisis in uh, ethical and social standards, right? That whether it's individual or, or shared. Yeah, maybe it's a general cloud over a civilization where you don't, can't really orient yourself. You don't know what means what, so you don't know how to move forward in your life. Um, and institutions definitely don't know how to move forward in that situation. Yeah, right. So, so you take this, uh, this condition and you push it to the great anomic crisis and that's what sparks all the tech to be invented. So my question would be like, why was important for you this anomic crisis as a topic right now to investigate in your work? Um, it was maybe something I was feeling when making the work. Uh, I was anticipating the birth of my first daughter, Eden, and I was imagining the world that she would grow up in. I was also imagining myself at a certain crossroads uh, in my own life. And I had read this Stephen King book. Um, he's a horror novelist, a uh, very prolific writer, and he, he was saying, oh, when I... When I was writing The Shining, I had imagined what was the worst possible father I could be. And he imagined himself as a, an alcoholic writer with writer's block trapped in a cabin with his family who he resented for his writer's block and he would kill them. That's The Shining. And I thought, oh, what's the worst father I could be? I was so anxious becoming a new dad. 
I thought, oh, it's the guy who conflates his work with his kid and tries to make them the same thing. And I think that's Dr. Wong's primary error as a protagonist or as a, 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 and as a father in this film. Um, and that conflation is the source of all the conflict that, um, that generates this movie. Right, I, I didn't see the shining coming into this conversation, but <laughs> the seams and shining, I, I love the references. So, uh, you know, I, I had the opportunity to watch the movie a couple of times, you know, to prepare for tonight. And I have to say the first time I watched it, I felt quite disoriented, but you know, not in a negative way per se, but uh, you know, the movie is very intricate in the jumps in perception that it makes, you know, like you being Charlie's essentially so you you see what Charlie's perceives of the outside world what Charlie's perceives of her inner empire uh, what Charlie's perceives of the life of Z and all the subplots so there are many o of these jumps and that reminded me of the very famous uh, Zhuangzi dreaming a butterfly you know tale from from Taoist philosophy so is the dream the reality or the other way around so which reality of the many that Charlie's experiences uh, often at the same time is more real yeah, I mean, I, in the film, you follow her subjective experience through the wavy verse, and if it wasn't totally clear, there's certain scenes where maybe you saw their mouth wasn't moving, but they were kind of talking in this echoey voice, and that was sort of the men, the, the internet, I imagine, where the internet would eventually um, go move all the way down and touch your nervous system um, through your brain into your nervous system. And that would open up a whole world of possibilities of what you experience physically. You could have other people or entities drone you in your body. So Bob did a lot of like physical chores through Chalice's body, dealt with conflicts with her father. Meanwhile, Chalice was off in the wavy verse, this kind of mental internet. And yeah, I think, you know, so much of making this film was... I love Marvel movies. And one of the reasons why I love Marvel movies is because... in the it's genius how they produced it. They produced each Marvel movie focused on one character before they got to the Avengers movie. So you really earned and lo started to love each character first before you had the mega almost um, culmination of different ways of being, um, being generous with Marvel here. I mean, it's also just, but it, there's something beautiful about that structure. And I thought, oh, it would be so beautiful to uh, have this sandbox to speculate different archetypes of being in the 21st century. And if I could just focus on one character at a time, in this case, Chalice, and maybe I could do further episodes that focused on some of the other characters you met. And there would be an Avengers episode at the end where different ways of being in the 21st century could meet. And for me, Chalice, as I was writing this, it became, I think, a new archetype of unearned life experience. You know, we talk about people with like unearned, I don't know, like they're, they're born with a furnished home, but Chalice is born a little bit with like a level ups uh, in terms of like personal psychology. She has this inner coach. And at the end of the film, she has 10 years of unearned life experience that she has to I don't throw out and say, this is AI just gone crazy and wrong, and therefore I'm starting over, but with the mentality of a 10 year old or in the, all this weird muscle memory, or I try to integrate and accept some of this life that Bob had lived for me, many lives that Bob lived for me from ages 10 to 20, and somehow mm, try to like move forward with that, even though it was unexperienced directly by her. And this, I feel, was a, I landed by the time I f finished the film, was a kind of a new archetype of being that I didn't, I don't know, it doesn't exist yet, but maybe it will. No, it's very, th this is very interesting. I would like to open yeah, oh, I already see, I, I knew the movie. Okay, Yante is coming with, with the mic. Thanks. Could you tell us a little bit about how the interactive version's played? Well, is it, uh, is it through, through a screen? Because I, I saw a video and it looked like it was um, a, a room with sensors in it. Yeah, yeah, let me uh, speak about that for a moment. So, <laughs> you know, I made this and uh, we started working on this, I uh, started working with Veronica So, who's here, my producer. We started working on this in 20, like late 2019. I thought, oh, I'm gonna have a kid. I'm gonna, I was previously working on this like AI, like this kind of agent-based AI stuff. I'm like, oh, that's so hard, so rewarding, but hard. I'm gonna be easy on myself and we're gonna make a cartoon. How hard could that be? Of course, it's like so fucking hard because it's all the all the pos all the steps to make it are seemingly well known, but they're like they're no joke. You know, make up a make a story that's like no joke. Um, cast hire, you know. And then I decided, oh, why not? Let's make it in the Unity video game engine, so it's a real time cartoon. Should we need that challenge? 
I say that facetiously a little bit, but also I was anticipating thinking, well, I'm an artist and in film production, especially animation production, it's extremely expensive to change your mind. Like once you get down the road of animating a scene, the character's performing a certain way, if you don't like it, it's gonna cost you, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars to shift that performance. Pixar has the luxury of doing that with a shifting deadline. I had a deadline and a budget. I thought, oh, if we could use a Unity, the Unity video game engine, which I've been using for my simulations before, I could still be the artist who changes his mind and be the director of a film, and we could iterate, we could change the angles, we could change the lighting, we could change performances very instantly because it was in the video game engine. I mean, not completely painlessly, but quite quick. So we started there, and then by the time we were wrapping the production of the narrative part, my daughter was around one and a half, two, and I'd been reading her this book called The Big Red Barn, which is a very simple children's book, kind of a bedtime routine about animals going to bed at night in the barn. Um, pretty basic, and she thought it was basic too, but the, the images are beautiful. And so by the time, I don't know, three or four times reading it, she would just tell me, Daddy, stop, Eden, go in. Meaning she didn't want me to flip the page, she wanted me to go into the page. Her name's Eden, she goes, she wants to go in. I was like, what does that mean? And she goes, in, like, cow eat egg, and then, it's, then I have to improvise. Oh, what if the cow ate the egg? And then, um, cow poop egg, egg turn into chicken, ha ha ha. Like, so she would just kind of improvise like the character she saw there, and I would kind of fill in the gaps as her dad. I thought, oh shit, if I, was a, if I was a kid now, that's exactly what I would want for my media. I'd watch the narrative a couple times, metabolize that, great. But if the world was compelling enough, I would want to go into it, and so, Toward the end of production, because we were in the video game engine, I started to develop a feature called, I call it world watching, where you can pause the film at any point. Uh, and you could, you know, the typical like controller thing, you could fast forward, rewind, but then you could click on anything in the frame and the camera framing would zoom in on that object. We're in a video game engine, so it's effectively a virtual dollhouse. And it would bring up all the lore and mythology from this Life After Bob wiki we made. You could rotate around it, you could reframe the shot. You could kind of fulfill this fantasy of going into the film just a little bit. And for me, this is a real prototype of how maybe media in the future will be uh, much more fluid from uh, kind of a passive narrative cinematic mode that requires your full attention and um, tries to engage your emotions to something more interactive like a game or something exploratory um, where you can learn more about a world that you love. I mean, if any of you have seen Spirited Away, like you want to pause that movie every single frame because there's chock full of details that you just want to love and eat up, but you're not allowed to, and that's maybe part of the lure, but I want to be allowed to, and I think it's almost possible right now. Thank you. Uh, there was a reference to, to Zoroastra, I think, in the movie. If I got this right, maybe you could oh, elaborate Oh, yeah, that's the kind more. of the, the CEO's name, the kind of mm, wild, reckless CEO's name. He calls himself Z, though. It is. I mean, yeah, he, he chose that name in a kind of, yeah, in a kind of... Um... None that I would care to share here, but yeah, like it's, I mean, it's not no big secret, but yeah, like uh, this kind of proto-religion uh, that like maybe preceded everything else. I think Z, maybe some backstory, he like saw himself as some proto-figure to a much bigger universe. Oh, I, have a, I have a question on, uh, I had the feeling there were a lot of um, influence, or influences in the movie from some philosophers. Can you like tell me some more about the, the influences you took from maybe philosophy to, to arrive at the point of an AI living a big part of your life? Yeah, maybe the biggest book that had an influence on what you just saw was this book called What Do You Say After You Say Hello by a, a, psychiatrist, a psychologist called Eric Byrne. And he was a, psych a psychologist from the 70s. He's famous for this thing called transactional analysis. He thought that in... Freudian analysis where it's just a patient, you know, laying down with a therapist that the patient doesn't accurately self-report. You know, you can't just tell your therapist stuff that how you saw it. And you thought, oh, if you observe people interacting with other people, you kind of get a, a picture into their true self. And you would observe that a person, after many, many thousands of patients doing transactional analysis, that every person had a child inside of them, a, a parent, and, a, and an adult ego state. Very similar to Freud's... Um, it, ego, super ego, but um, with some details. Um, um, but the other thing that he wrote, 
was this thing about life scripts. And this is how, do, what do you say after you say hello? And his idea there was that everyone, especially the children, model their idea of a lifetime, which is way too long and vast and detailed to actually think about on a story. And the most easy story that a child's often exposed to in early age is a fairy tale. So often a child might model what they project their life to be on a fairy tale character. That's why fairy tales are so potent, he speculates. And so this idea of a life script is on one hand an orienting thing of how your life might go. So you can kind of park certain chapters in your mind, like, are you gonna go to school? Are you gonna go to college? I mean, the basic script might be go to college, get married, have kids, retire, die, right? Like a classic script. Um, but it gets more complicated with like, you know, uh, fucked up parenting and like or, uh, neglect. And it gets, um, but, turn, but fairy tales seem to cover the range of that. Anyways, it dovetails nicely with this thing that he points out that Carl Jung said, which is that everyone lives out a myth, but you might not know what that myth is and you better find out because maybe you find out that the myth is a tragedy and you might want to rewrite it. And um, he proposes that this is the whole point of, Therapy, psychoanalysis, transactional analysis is the ability to become aware of what your script might be unconsciously and at least having the choice to rewrite it or at least choosing the parts of it that you still like. And for me, this had a profound influence on writing this and thinking about, well, we're never really going to escape that problem of a life script because we can't conceptualize individually what our life is going to play out with. We need this prosthetic of a story. So it's going to be a persistent problem in our future, even when we have AI to help us. I thought, oh, that's a pretty interesting world to to live in, and that was definitely the basis for Life After Bob. The original title, the cumbersome title for Life After Bob was Life Scripts After AI. Like, what would they be? Hi. Um, first of all, thank you, and uh, very, very nice, interesting movie, and um, I was just thinking of starting uh, learning Unreal Engine to use um, in my videos, so it's very motivating to see how great they can turn up. In the, I, I heard you use Unity. Um, I don't have a question per se, but at the expense of looking really stupid, I have a confession. Um, the way that Bob is portrayed in the movie um, and how the, how the character relates to, to it uh, is a bit how I feel talking to ChatGPT right now. Because it's... It's lit in a world where we're living post-Trump. I have this unlimitedly knowledgeable entity that I can access from any device that I carry. And um, it can give me ideas about anything and everything. And um, in, the, in, the de in the detail above you write, what if AI can do your job of living your life better than you? I don't know if it's living my life yet, but it can do my job better than me for sure. And um, yeah, there's so many tools coming up every single day. It's even overwhelming to try to catch up. I today experimented with, um, with a music program. That's the first music program that sounds really decent. So basically, what do you think about this? <laughs> I mean, I think I wrote Life After Bob to speculate what that might be when, I mean, it's a hyperbolic subtitle, like, you know, uh, what if AI could do your life better than you, do the job of living your life better than you? Um, because Bob can drone Chalice's physical body, I felt, you know, I was entitled to that hyperbole. But uh, yeah, it's something I wondered about when writing this. And when you take away the basic things that you think can, can, can uh, compose your like working identity, like what you might be doing for work, like well, what's left of you? You have to kind of figure that out and that's an annoying and difficult question. And I thought, oh, in the future where there's more of that, more and more people would have to confront that introspective question and they would have to really you know, be annoyed by that question. And Chalice is really annoyed by that question. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's what you're articulating now is basically the reason why I want to make, one of the reasons why I want to make this film and explore for myself in making a speculative version of it. Now it's so crazy that, I mean, we're maybe five steps away from it existing. You can imagine ChatGPT being paired with uh, a much more inferential uh, AI model that can like start to like learn a little bit more about the specifics of your own behavior. And then front ended with something like ChatGPT, like can talk to you in different ways as you need to. I mean, it's the ultimate, I don't know, imaginary friend, therapist, sibling, 
mirror self. I mean, it's a lot coming. Hi, I want to thank you for your work because it's super important. Hi, over here. <laughs> it's super important with the upcoming of uh, the cognitive internet, which is something that we are going to see in the next few years. And you were talking about your gaming influences. I'm a gamer as well. And I was thinking about the skill trees, like the deployment, the visuals of a skill tree, and also the brain dancings from Cyberpunk. And I wanted to ask you because I thought like the memories were like something like was just momentous, not something like were like downloading into Charlie's brain. How, how did it work? Because there was a physicality to the touching and the remembering of the, of the memories. And also ask you about like other gaming influences in, in the movie. Uh, are you referring to the part where she has this like little pin and she like pricks herself? Yeah, I was trying to get at this idea that she doesn't have the episodic memory. Like she doesn't remember the the moment that she, you know, raised Sheba dogs, uh, that Bob did that for her. But somehow it's in her body, like this petting motion. And so those pins were like almost um, markers or landmarks that Bob left for her, so that if she pinned it in the right place on her hand, it would activate a certain muscle memory that would give her a little bit more hint of what the episodic memory would have been. It's very weird to have muscle memory where you don't know where it comes from, and we're filled with them. Um, it's a very famous book called The Body Keeps the Score, and it's like, it's about this really weird schism where your body just knows certain things, but you don't remember it, so you don't have a story for it, so you can't cohere why it's part of you. And I think I was trying to get a little bit of that um, physically. Um, Sorry, you're asking about game, something about games? Gaming influences. Yeah, the gaming influences, because I, I thought like the, the skill tree, the way that you deploy uh, the choices for the future path were kind of similar with the skill tree when you do like an RPG and you are choosing your, your path in an RPG. Yeah, it's so funny, I was thinking about yeah, RPG menus a lot recently. Um, it is the moment in a game where you're in the th thick of action and when you pause it and look at your inventory stuff, that is an introspective moment. It's the way we were express introspection in a game uh, and we like pause the world of the game the timeline of the game and then we go through our mental inventory of what do we got to offer the situation and to re-steer it and i think in a way rpgs have already mastered that language how you flicker between action and introspection and so i wanted to borrow a little bit from that um, could have gone even further i think yeah hi um thank you it's a fascinating uh, movie uh, so yeah, my question is about like, I think there is this kind of uh, constant uh, race about uh, what is it that the machine can do better than humans and what is it that humans can do better than the machine. And uh, initially it was like physical, mechanical stuff. And then it's, uh, well, the machine, the AI can make better decisions, but we are more creative. And now the AI is actually also excelling at creativity, but uh, maybe we have emotions, and now we have like AI that actually can detect emotion perhaps better than humans. And so what's the next thing? And uh, um, one of the things that I think I see in the movie, and I, that, uh, that I'm curious uh, if, it's, if, it's, it's, if it's actually your opinion, is like there's this thing of um, um, spirituality, maybe not, not necessarily the religious sense, but in the sense of like, finding who you are and this is like something that is intrinsically human or at least that we still believe is intrinsically human uh, and in this movie it seems that you're actually slightly uh, on the one hand like the bob is actually living your life and actually telling you, you who you should be which is impinging upon the spiritual part but at the same time all of a sudden that leaves time for people to explore their uh, godness and uh, the, the other part which is actually like this is the AI, because the AI is living our life, now we have the time to actually engage into a spiritual path. So this is like, uh, do, do you feel that this is the next stage uh, that the AI or the machine has not reached yet? And is it, is it about to reach there as well or not? You mean in real life? Yes. You know, the one thing that I, um, when I see ChatGPT or all the stable diffusion stuff, um, so amazing, or even self-driving car stuff, the one thing that's still, that we still furnish is its motivations. Like in ChatGPT, you are furnishing it with a prompt. This is your motivation to start the conversation going, and it's just responding to you. So you're furnishing a motivation. And what I tried to, what, what I think is maybe, that, that may be the missing thing that will be fulfilled very soon, uh, where we have AI that furnishes its own motivations and wants to align its, its some set of internal needs, whatever they might be, they're not gonna be physiological needs, with the affordances of the environment, and that's gonna be really crazy. Um, it's, it's a bit abstract what I'm saying, but did you kinda know what I mean? Like when you drive a 
when you enter a self-driving car like a Tesla, you're furnishing it with a destination. Like it's not deciding it wants to, I don't know, go to Rotterdam. It would be interesting if it did, and you would want to know why it wants to go to Rotterdam. Um, we're missing that. When that's going to be furnished, I think pretty soon. And it's something that I'm, I've, I was trying to explore in earlier work with these agent-based simulations, where in order to watch the agent do anything interesting, it has to be furnishing its own motivations. It's something I'm continuing to work on now. Um, but that's an interesting piece of the AI puzzle, motivation. We have sensing. We have all the pattern recognition. Um, but the motivational aspect is kind of an interesting part that hasn't been explored, I think. Thanks. Hey, hi. Um, I was just curious to what extent you used also AI in the, um, uh, in the process of making this movie through Unity. Because, I, um, for example, with the emissary, you really created like NPC that were autonomous and creating all the, um, the world building and narration on their own. And here, if I understand correctly, this, this, this anime is really your editing, right? That you do, you did, or did you also let the, some uh, some kind of evolution through AI in the in the choice of the um, uh, cutting of the scenes or the camera angle camera, or you just edit it uh, really control every step of the movie? Uh, the latter. I wanted to make my life easy <laughs> after having kids, and then <laughs> tried to do the latter, which became way harder. You know, if I were to make this movie now, with all the on-hand generative AI tools, like I would make this movie so differently. One of the very first prototypes we did before starting in pre-production was we thought we'd give Unity, we'd render in Unity a very basic version of the film and we thought we could style transfer like it to look like anime so we wouldn't have to like take the effort to like figure out what the characters really look like. And it was like a Frankenstein mess. But now, my God, I've seen people do it on Twitter already, like you can do it. And so were we to make this thing, same thing now, it would probably be using a lot more generative AI tools to just get at the iterative process faster so you can just be an artist more rather than be bogged down with the expensive directorial process that I think slows down like getting to a better story, getting to a better performance. All the way up. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, hey, thank you. Um, uh, sorry if I'm doubling down on this question because I'm curious about your approach uh, when you use um, Persian mythology like Zoroastrianism because I'm not sure what you try to borrow uh, from that kind of mythology into your work uh, or into this uh, fiction that you, that you built. You mean just that particular name, naming the character Z? No, because I, I remember there was a mentioning of Zoroastrian in the film, so... I'm not sure if it was a direct uh, reference to that or... Yeah, it was the name of the, it's the kind of the CEO character. Yeah. Yeah, he named himself that. Or I guess I named him as the author. <laughs> uh, so it's just a name, it's not... It's just a name, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I regret to inform you that part of the world is uh, very underwritten. Um... First of all, I really appreciate about the amazing film and like while watching your artwork, I could feel like the parenting and also the stories, the stories about the Charlie's 10 years old little girl and her Bob. And I'm curious about like, did your daughter like the film and like, did she also like the idea of Bob? She liked it insofar as when she was at that age, it was the only cartoon she was allowed to watch because she would just like <laughs> beg mommy to just sit on daddy's lap while daddy works like during COVID. So she had no other option but to watch Life After Bob. And eventually I was like, if she can't be watching this, she should be watching Totoro. And so we, she got Totoro. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the great film. Uh, I was wondering, within the in this world, uh, what is the data set that Bob is based on? Is it Dr. Wong, or is it bigger? As, uh, did he create a bigger data set to base the knowledge of Bob on? Oh, that's an interesting question. You mean like fictionally? Like what would it what would it have been? Um, well, his whole argument for why. 
he his whole argument for why the whole movie had to exist and the whole chalice study project had to exist is that he gave Bob to chalice at birth. So the data set started at her birth. The life logs was like recording every chalice, neuro, neuro firing, uh, every muscle spasm, and making sense of all that data from birth. And his argument was, we can't know what a destiny Bob will do to a person until they get to a certain age. So therefore, you know, back off company, like let me do my R&D for decades. It was also a way to procrastinate too, you know, to claim that your product needs that much incubation time. And Z, what starts the story is he's just getting antsy. It's been 10 years already. It's 10 years is way too long already. And so he just like kind of steals one of the prototypes and gives it to Orlando. But it's inappropriate because it's been barely trained on Orlando and it kind of shallowly infers what Orlando's goal might be, which is to win a, a number one winner medal in a cycling competition. It's like, what does an Olympic athlete do after they finish the Olympics? It's a really big existential question. So if you can imagine for Orlando, who's like a mediocre cyclist at best. It's like even worse. And so, yeah, I think the data set's just chalice since birth, all the nervous system. Um, yeah. So it's yourself. It's yourself, yeah. I think we have five minutes. So if you have one or two last questions, think them up. If there's someone else who wants to ask a question, I've I've been uh, I've asked a question before, but I was wondering, at the end, um, Chalice wants to relive all the experience that that uh, Bob lived for her. Is this like also a bit of your own opinion on that experiences are more important than, for instance, not having these experiences? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I think the thing that Z was trying to get out that Chalice tries to explore at the end is this idea of the subplot. And what I was trying to get out, communicate there, is if you can imagine in your own life, there's like certain details of your life. Like, I'll just use myself as an example. Like, oh, like my mom made me do karate in fourth grade and I hated it. And I stopped thinking about it as soon as I started hating it. And we stopped after the first karate lesson. I hated it. Haven't thought about it for years. And then suddenly, like it's 2022 after COVID, I find myself doing jujitsu, like, because a friend told me I'd be interested in that, and I thought, oh, yeah, that sounds okay, I'll try it. And I fell in love with it. And I realized, well, there was some thread of, you know, this kind of idea of physical conflict in a protected environment that is a martial art that started there. And I feel like I'm picking up on some subplot that is, it's not the, I'm not gonna do MMA, I mean, quit art and do MMA, but it is the subplot in my life that I feel is reactivating and definitely enriching the other parts of my life. And it took a kind of a random friend to like just suggest it, let alone and randomly, I definitely didn't remember that random part of hating karate. I wish I did, because then maybe I would have gone to it sooner. And so, and the technology that Z invents and um, tries to foist on everyone, it's called Thousand Lives, is to get all the different little, the crumbs of your life that have nothing to do with your identity, but you still experience. And maybe there's something, there's a, a, be, there's a trail there that you could follow that might actually be uh, a set of, become a set of options for what you might do when you don't know what to do with yourself. So one last thing, maybe going after his words, and regarding your answer, maybe there's a difference between knowing something and experiencing it. For example, you can know honey, you can know the color of it, you can know the chemic formula of it, you can read the encyclopedia and read about honey, but until you tasted it, you actually don't know what it is. So maybe this goes after your answer. So in order to really know something, you need to experience it. I think so, because when you know something, it's a very low dimensional way of knowing it. When you experience something, you're getting so many more dimensions. You can't, your conscious mind can't even count. And it goes into your unconscious mind, as far as I understand. And this is a way more powerful supercomputer uh, to process experience and to make sense of it, to make it coherent, maybe even you know make it fantastically coherent. And, but still, it, the, your unconscious tries to make sense of things that don't make sense in a way that I think your conscious mind is way too prudish and pedestrian to want to do. If it doesn't understand it, it's like, well, that's stupid, or uh, that's just like that other thing that happened before. But your unconscious mind really wants to work on 
problems it doesn't understand, and it can only really do that if it's fed with lots of experience. Um, I totally agree with that. I think we're running out of time, but there is time during the drinks just after this. So, well, thanks again for Ian for sharing all of this with us. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. So please enjoy the drinks. See you all outside. <laughs>